Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and uh, I see someone laying in his bed again. <laughs> a very tired Matthew. Hi, everybody. Hannah, you're, you've been, like, up and about since what time? I think I saw, like, three-something. So I picked up a little project um, for a medical cannabis client in the United Kingdom, and I wanted to, to um, interview some doctors to, mm-hmm. to understand perspectives. And, you know, doctors are hard to get a, a hold of, so the only time I could talk to a doctor this morning uh, was 11.30... London time, which was uh, 3.30 a.m. my time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so he's a fascinating doctor, and it was an interesting conversation, if that counts for anything. so Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's forge forth if you're up to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. 10 out of 10, right? <laughs> 10 out of 10, Mike. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, Odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work. Family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On December 18, 2014, 101-year-old Ernest Cote, a decorated World War II veteran, became the target of a violent home invasion. The assailant, Ian Bush, gained entry to Cote's secure condo building using fake City of Ottawa identification. Bush proceeded to rob and terrorize the elderly war hero, binding his hands, taping his mouth shut, and leaving him to suffocate with a plastic bag over his head. However, Cote's remarkable strength and presence of mind allowed him to break free, cut a hole in the bag, and call for help. Little did anyone know that Cote's bravery would not only save his own life, but would also lead to the resolution of a gruesome, unsolved triple homicide from 2007. The evidence Cote preserved, particularly the duct tape used to gag him, provided the crucial DNA link that connected Ian Bush to the murders of retired tax court judge Albin Garon, 77, and his wife Raymond Garon, 73, as well as their friend Mary Claire Beniscos, 78. These victims, all in their golden years, had been hogtied beaten and suffocated in the Garand's luxury condo, leaving investigators baffled for years. This is Dark Poutine episode 335, Ever a Hero, the 101-year-old who took down a killer. On top of the initial events of this compelling story, the date, June 29, 2007, was a significant moment in Canadian history. It was called the Aboriginal Day of Action. It was organized by the Assembly of First Nations, AFN, to bring attention to the pressing social, economic, and political challenges facing Indigenous communities across the country. 
The day served as a protest against what indigenous leaders saw as government inaction on critical issues such as poverty, inadequate housing, lack of clean drinking water, and substandard health care in First Nations communities. One of the most prominent events was the blockade of Ontario's Highway 401 near Deseronto by the Mohawks of the Bay Quinty, symbolizing the frustration and disruption experienced by many indigenous peoples due to the government's neglect. While Prime Minister Stephen Harper's government acknowledged the protests, no immediate solutions were offered, though the day succeeded in drawing national attention to indigenous issues, increasing pressure on the government to engage with First Nations leaders. Yeah, I mean, Harper's government, you know, it's kind of like they're acknowledging the protests, but let's be real, it's kind of a a nod that, yeah, we know what happened, and and that's like saying I hear you, but turning up the volume on your headphones, right? And it, it wasn't just let's let's be honest, not just the Harper government or a conservative government, you know, for for decades and decades and decades, successive governments really have hit snooze on a wake up call uh, uh, that indigenous communities had be, had been trying to ring for for a very long time. Um, you know, but, um, you know, this, this day of action, it was, it is one of, it's one of those pivotal days in our history. It was definitely a pivotal day for Indigenous communities and Canadians. However, for the families of Albin and Ramon Guerin and their friend Mary Claire Beniscos, June 29, 2007 would mark one of the darkest days of all their lives. Albin Guerin was born in Saint, Saint Lambert de Lausanne, Quebec on March 4, 1930. After high school, Albin pursued his legal studies at Laval University in Quebec City and later the University of Ottawa, where he earned his law degree. He was called to the Quebec Bar in 1955 and distinguished himself early in his career, being honored with the title of Queen's Counsel in 1968. Garand's career in law was both extensive and impactful, from 1956 to 1978 and again from 1986 to 1992, He served as part-time professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law, where he influenced generations of students with his legal expertise. In addition to his academic contributions, Garand had a distinguished career with the Federal Department of Justice, where he practiced law from 1955 to 1986. During this period, he held several significant positions, including Chief of Legal Services for the Department of Public Works from 1959 to 1965. He then advanced to become the Director of Departmental Legal Services, a role he held from 1965 to 74, and his leadership continued as he served as Assistant Deputy Attorney General from 1974 to 1982, and subsequently as Associate Deputy Minister of Justice from 1982 to 1986. After leaving the Department of Justice, Garand returned to academia as the director of the French Legislative Drafting Program at the University of Ottawa, a position he held from 1986 to 1988. Albin Garand's judicial career began with his appointment as a judge of the Tax Court of Canada in September 1988. His legal acumen and leadership skills led to his appointment as Associate Chief Judge in February 1999 and later as Chief Judge in February 2000. He served as Chief Justice of the Tax Court of Canada from July 2, 2003 until his retirement in November 2004, leaving behind a legacy of judicial excellence. Justice Garand's wife was no less remarkable. Ramon Lorette was born in Ottawa on September 23, 1933 to Rodolphe Lorette and Marguerite Ecuyer. Ramon grew up in Vanier and worked as a nurse at Montfort Hospital's emergency ward. She regularly met with friends who called themselves the Golden Girls. They often got together for lunch, traveled to each other's cottages, and celebrated special occasions, especially birthdays. She and Albin were married in a Catholic ceremony in 1971, and both were devout. Although they had no children, they loved their nieces, nephews, and Elena Maria Duran. Elena was the next best thing to a daughter that the Garans had. She had come to Canada as a teen from El Salvador, and she was essentially their Spanish tutor. She lived with Albin and Ramon Garan for 12 years. Elena had only planned to stay in Canada for a year, but she fell in love with the country, and the Garands fell in love with her. 
They'd been learning to speak Spanish, taking night classes before she came, and were over the moon having a native Spanish speaker living in their home to practice with. Elena married Michelle Rochon in 1990 at the Garans condo. The couple became godparents to Elena's daughter, Marie Isabel, and the Garans remained close to Elena and her family and even had a cottage in Quebec beside the one the Rochons owned. These two really sound like they lived very full lives. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm getting a sense. It's, it's like that was filled with love, right, with loyalty, and opening your heart to somebody and proving that family is more than just blood, right? Right, Families who you choose. Yep. It sounds like, um, you know, they were just good, smart people and good people. And and it's it's just yeah. it's, I just it's so terrible uh, this twist that that uh, that came in their lives that no one saw coming. This story about Elena specifically reminds me of uh, a couple who were very good friends with my mom and dad, the Bonangs. They had an international student come from Sweden named Joel, and I remember that you know Joel stayed and and they just fell in love with him essentially and. And now Joel has since moved from Sweden and he runs, uh, I call him Uncle Lloyd, but he runs Uncle Lloyd's ready mix plant in outside of Bridgewater. So, you know, my brother had a, a, a lodger in, in his basement. Uh, I think she's actually from El Salvador who is studying and um, stayed, stayed lodged with them for years. And uh, they've remained friends. Actually, she came last time I was at my mom's house. She was there for Christmas. I love stories like that. In retirement, the Grands settled into a 10th floor unit in a luxury condominium complex called Riviera 2 at 1510 Riverside Drive in Ottawa. According to a real estate website, Riviera 1 and 2, located at 1500 and 1510 Riverside Drive, were built in 1986 and 98 by the Riverside Group. These buildings and 1480 Riverside Drive, the classics, share nine acres of professionally manicured grounds featuring fountains, walking areas, pavilions, and picnic areas with gas barbecues. Riviera 1 has 26 stories with 200 units, and Riviera 2, where the Garons lived, has 28 stories with 195 units offering one, two, and three bedroom layouts. Both buildings boast a grand foyer with marble floors and rich wood accents. Most units include high ceilings, open concept living spaces, large windows, spacious bedrooms with a primary ensuite, and oversized balconies. Kitchens offer ample cabinet and counter space, tiled backsplashes, or have been renovated to be open concept. Residents have access to the Riviera Club. This club features a glass walkway, indoor and outdoor pools, a hot tub, tennis, and pickleball courts, a billiards room, a gym, a golf driving net, yoga and Pilates classes, and a solarium, all set within beautifully landscaped surrounding. The Riviera is within walking distance of the train yard shopping center and is close to, river, close to Riverside Hospital and CHEO. Public transportation is convenient with Herdman LRT Station just a four-minute walk away and Tremblay LRT via rail station an 18-minute walk away. It is an idyllic, gated community in which murders weren't supposed to happen. Uh, yeah, the way that the world is going, Mike, uh, mm. I kind of, some days I just want to put like a giant wall around the complex that I live in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, I, you know, so much of life right now is just feeling embattled and, and you know, with crime and everything else. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's probably not the solution, but gated community, despite this happening, still probably safer, is yeah. very, very appealing to me right now. Things will get better. <laughs> he said not knowing whether they would or not. <laughs> the day before they were murdered, Albin and Ramon went to a birthday party at the Canada Holiday Inn in Ottawa. While there, Ramon spoke to her friends about a strange encounter she'd had a day before with a man at the couple's home. Ramon told them that a man had come to their apartment and stated that he had a delivery. He asked Ramon if she was Mrs. Garon, and she replied yes. He then asked her if her husband was home and indicated he had a package for him. Ramon informed the delivery man that Alban was not home and would be back later, but he could leave the package with her. 
The man then stated that he had forgotten the package in his truck and had no time to return and get it. The man said he would return the next day. Ramon offered to pick up the package, but the man insisted he would return the next day, indicating he wanted to give the package to Albin Garon directly. What a strange interaction, but it wouldn't be clear how important that interaction was until the events of the next day. The Garons left the party at around 10.30 that night, and it was the last time many of their friends saw them alive. June 29, 2007 was supposed to be just another summer day filled with friends and fun, lunch with buddies, and an afternoon of sailing at nearby Aylmer. Their neighbor, Marie Claire Beniscos, was coming over that morning so they could plan to go out that evening and see a movie together. The three of them never made it to any of their scheduled events. Mary Claire Beniscos lived in the same building as the Garons after the death of her husband, Dr. Jean-Marie Beniscos, with whom she had a daughter, Louise. Born to Armand and Irene Bertrand, she grew up in a close-knit family with her brother Jean-Georges and sisters Marie-Paul, Denise, Pierrette, Giselle, and Francine. Family was vital to Mary Claire. She loved her grandchildren, Philippe and Nicole. According to news reports, Mrs. Beniscos, an avid golfer, was one of Ramon Garon's golden girls. The pair were like sisters. She also attended the same Catholic church as the Garons. There, she was known as a happy and very nice person who volunteered in various church activities, including organizing spaghetti dinners for the congregation. Ferdinand Bossi, another neighbor in the building, said, quote, She was a very dedicated and religious woman, end quote. Her generosity extended to her volunteer work with the Friends of the Hospital General Campus, where she had been recently honored for 20 years of dedicated service. Mary Claire's warmth, energy, and commitment to helping others left an indelible mark on all that knew her. On the morning of June 30th, 2007, Jean-Pierre Lorette, Ramon's brother, who also lived in the same building, became concerned when he couldn't raise anyone in the Giron's home. He went to their apartment and found the door unlocked. Walking inside, he found a gruesome scene. Albin, Ramon, and Mary Claire Beniscos all lay dead inside the suite. According to court documents, Albin Garon, Ramon Garon, and Mary Claire all had plastic bags placed over their heads before they were killed. The bag over Albin Garon's head was held tightly in place with a noose fashioned out of yellow nylon cord. An expert in knots indicated that Quote, Considering the complexity of the gallows knot, it is likely that structure was prefabricated. End quote. The killer had brought that to the crime scene. Albin Garon's hands and arms were bound by a quote, complex system of restraint ligatures end quote, made of a black shoelace, a white lightly braided cord, and some twine. The loose end of the bag over Ramon's head was tied off at the back of her neck. The clear plastic bag over Mrs. Benisco's head was not tied off or secured. Both Ramon and Mary Claire were found hogtied with twine, face down. The ligatures were so extensive, and because they were face down, they would have had no ability to attempt to free themselves or move. During his final moments, Albin Garon, the apparent focus of the attacks, endured a horrific and violent assault. He received severe blunt force trauma to his face, with multiple impacts leaving devastating injuries. The area around his right ear suffered extensive damage resulting in a significant skull fracture, bleeding on the brain's surface, and direct brain injury. His body bore numerous wounds including injuries to his face, scalp, limbs, and torso, as well as fractured ribs. A weapon was likely used in the attack. In addition to the beating, Albin was partially strangled with a ligature. While Ramon Garon and Mrs. Benisco suffered fewer injuries, their ordeal was still severe, and they both had multiple bruises on their arms, shoulders, neck, and back, all caused by blunt force trauma. Mrs. Benisco also endured blunt force injuries to her upper body, shoulders, knees, and torso, including rib fractures. The psychological trauma experienced by these victims is almost unimaginable. Ramon was forced to witness the brutal beating of her husband, knowing that she and her close friend would soon meet the same fate. The terror and anguish they endured in those final moments are beyond words. It was determined that all of them had been asphyxiated by the bags that had been placed over their heads. Yeah, when I was reading the script, um, that's exactly how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, 
this this was not um you know one person having a quick death right no. this was three people having to see it all happen and knowing which way it was headed which is just not not the last moments of your life that anyone deserves yeah police collected evidence including hair from an unknown male and a bloody shoe print at the scene believed to be from a New Balance sneaker. Police also gathered two samples of DNA from an unknown male from the bodies. Police investigators determined that the three were killed between 9 in the morning and noon on June 29th inside the Garon's condo. Raymond herself had helped with the timeline. Recovering from a recent surgery, she diligently checked and recorded her blood pressure in her diary that morning. Friends, family, and neighbors of all three victims were horrified. Charmaine Hill, another resident at the condo complex, said of Marie Claire Beniscos, quote, She moved here because it was safe. She was afraid of living in her home. End quote. Miss Hill said she had called Mrs. Beniscos on June 30th to ask if she'd like to go swimming at the building's pool, but there was no answer. The bodies were found later that same day. The luxury condominium complex had several security features in place, including surveillance cameras. These cameras were located at the front gate and in common areas of the complex. Eight video screens were in the guarded gatehouse, suggesting multiple camera feeds. However, despite the presence of this camera equipment, it was revealed that the footage was not recorded. Michael LaFontaine, the vice president and general manager of Apollo Property Management, the company managing the complex, explained that the cameras only fed live video to monitors in the gatehouse. The security system relied on guards actively watching these monitors in real time. This setup meant that if a guard saw something suspicious, they would be expected to call the police immediately. However, without any recording capability, there was no way to review past footage or capture evidence of any incidents that might have occurred when guards weren't actively watching the screens. Yeah, you know, you you live in a in in a complex. I live in a complex, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, managing a complex like things cost money, but well, that was a luxury condo complex, you know, like. You think with today's technology mm -hmm. and the amount of cloud storage you could have that they could, you know, there could be something where it just crunches data and saves it pretty easily just yep. in case. You would think. It appears this might have been a cost-saving measure. The condominium's board of directors decided against recording the security footage, though LaFontaine mentioned that his company had previously recommended it. Some residents, like Charmaine Hill, were surprised to learn the cameras weren't recording, as they had assumed otherwise. Police investigators, particularly Staff Sergeant Rick Heyman, expressed disappointment at the lack of recorded footage. They viewed it as a significant setback to the investigation, as video evidence could have provided crucial information about vehicles, individuals, or suspicious activity around the time of the murders. It's worth noting that the security measures varied between the complex's buildings. For instance, Paolo Sirocco, the condo complex's Common Facilities Committee chairman, mentioned that his building recorded surveillance video and had a security guard in the lobby. In contrast, the building where the murders occurred relied solely on the unrecorded camera feeds monitored at the front gate. This revelation especially after what had occurred, led to discussions among residents about enhancing security measures across the complex. According to the Ottawa Citizen, this was not the first time an address connected to the Girons had been involved in a multiple homicide. In an eerie coincidence, two years before their murders, the home they'd lived in from 1973 to 1983 on Northdale Street had been the site of a triple murder. In a case of familicide, Daniel Maxillo stabbed to death his father, Gerard, mother, Louise, and his 25-year-old sister, Michelle. What, okay, what are the chances mm. of not just a murder, yeah. but like a multiple murder in, 
you know, of where these guys lived before. Slim to none. I mean, those chances are very low, especially in a city like Ottawa. There's not a lot of murder in Ottawa. Astronomical. And Mm -hmm. I feel like we now have to do that other case. I was thinking about that too. I mean, and that's why I always hesitate mentioning other cases, but because I'm so compelled to learn more. Uh, Maybe we'll look into that one. That sounds terrible. Yeah. The Garons were so consistent in their lives that the same priest who had married them 36 years before presided over their packed funeral mass on July 10th. Garon was remembered by his peers for his impeccable professionalism and contributions to law, including his role in bilingualization legal terms. Marie-Claire Benisco's funeral details were published in the Ottawa Citizen on July 14, 2007. The article called Marie Claire Beniscos, a 78-year-old woman of light. Known for her contagious joie de vivre, she was remembered as an active community member, volunteering at her parish and the Ottawa Hospital. Despite losing her husband a decade ago, she maintained a vibrant social life, participating in costume parties and social clubs. Friends recalled her positive attitude and organizing skills, with one remarking that even the sky is crying as rain fell before her funeral service. According to the National Post, on July 11, 2007, Ottawa police released information about a potential witness in the triple homicide case. A white male in his early 40s was seen in the elevator of the victim's condominium building between 10 and 11 a.m. on June 29, the day before the bodies were discovered. While police did not label him a suspect, they emphasized that he might have valuable information for the investigation. Staff Sergeant Monique Paris noted that various reasons could explain the man's presence, but he remains one of the few unidentified individuals in the case. A composite sketch was created based on a witness's description depicting a man 5'8 and 180 pounds with short, black and gray hair. Relatives of Raymond Garon expressed their hope for a swift resolution and urged anyone with information to come forward. This development came shortly after friends of the Garon criticized the police for their perceived lack of progress in the case, calling them Keystone Cops. In the weeks following the murders, numerous tips led to little progress beyond the composite sketch. There was also the mystery delivery driver that Raymond had seen in the days before the murders. Delivery companies and Canada Post said that none of their employees had packages for the Garons. Another important loose end. More after a quick break. And we are back from our break, Matthew. Thoughts so far? You know, through all of this, my one thought... Um, is that these people are the same age as my mom and yeah. my stepdad. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, you know, my mom doesn't look like either of the ladies, but she looks like both of the ladies. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's sort of a woman of that age. Like, I can totally see my mom and them in so many ways. So yeah, it's, me too. Mm-hmm. It's, so for somebody, you know, for somebody to have to go through this at that ripe old age where there's still a lot of time left in their yeah. lives. Yeah. Um, so horrifyingly, it just is so wrong. Early theories about the murders were all over the place. The police focused early on Elena Maria Duran Rochon and her husband, Michelle. Elena and their teenage daughter, Marie Isabel, were set to receive the bulk of the Garon's estate. The Rochons were asked twice to take polygraph tests to help rule them out. They refused, calling the requests insulting, and said the insinuation was extremely stressful. Michelle and Elena allowed a police to obtain a sample of their DNA and gave them their banking records and fingerprints. Elena told the Ottawa citizen that she and her family fell asleep every night, thinking the whole thing was some nightmare. There was also the possibility that the murders were a hit by organized crime like the Russian Mafia, or by an individual with a grudge against Albin Garon for his career as Chief Justice of the Tax Court of Canada. Albin Garon was pivotal in a 2002 judicial disciplinary inquiry that disrupted a gangster trial involving the Hells Angels in Montreal. Garon and two other prominent judges investigated inappropriate remarks made by Quebec Superior Court Judge Jean-Guy Boilard, 
who was presiding over the trial of 17 Hells Angels members. Garand's critical letter about Boylard's conduct, describing his comments as disgraceful and abusive, led to Boylard's resignation, the jury's dismissal, and a retrial. Despite this, retired PEI Supreme Court Judge Armand Des Rocha, who worked with Garand on the inquiry, expressed disbelief that Garand's brutal murder was connected to the Hells Angels or the trial. He noted the killings happened many years after the trial, and Garand, a well-regarded public servant, had no known enemies. Often when police can't figure something out, you get kind of wild theory. Look at what we talked about, what I talked about earlier with uh, Elena and Michelle being looked at as suspects. I mean, I get it, but I but they went a little hard at them, you know? Uh, and it's people trying to make sense of it, but there's something... I now know the rest of the script, but when I was reading this, Mike, I was feeling like because of who he is i'm i was feeling like even at this point that there's something there there's some connection to that job it's so mm-hmm. i was like yeah well, at my first reaction was wild theories and i'm like wait a minute this he was high profile right yeah and uh, i'm like there has to be something there the other judge said no known enemies but we will see in 2008 to revitalize the investigation Ottawa police offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. The Ottawa Police Services Board provided $75,000 of the reward, with the remaining $25,000 contributed by the late Alban Garon Reward Committee, a group of former friends and colleagues of the three victims. The OPP and the RCMP continued investigating, but the, but the case remained relatively cold until late 2014 when things heated up significantly. The murder investigation kicked into high gear after a very similar attack on 101-year-old Ernest Cote in his Ottawa condominium on December 18th. Ernest Adolf Cote was a remarkable Canadian figure whose life spanned over a century and encompassed significant roles in military service, diplomacy, and civil administration. He was born in Edmonton in 1913 to French-Canadian parents. Cote's father was a government land surveyor from Quebec who went west in 1903 to determine the frontier between Alaska and the Yukon, and he subsequently became active as a mining engineer in Alberta, enjoying much success in his field and then entering politics. Cote's upbringing was steeped in Francophone culture and Jesuit education, laying the foundation for his future bilingual career. Cote's academic pursuits were impressive, earning a BA from the University of Laval and LLB from the University of Alberta. His legal education would prove valuable in his future roles, but his military service first brought him to prominence. Joining the Royal 22nd Regiment, known as the Van Dues, in 1939, Cote quickly rose through the ranks during World War II. His intelligence and strategic acumen led to his involvement in planning the D-Day invasion, a pivotal moment in the war. On June 6, 1944, Cote landed on Juneau Beach with the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, participating firsthand in one of history's most significant military operations. After the war, Cote seamlessly transitioned to a diplomatic career with the Department of External Affairs. His contributions in this field were substantial, including representing Canada at the United Nations and playing a pivotal role in drafting the World Health Organization's charter. Cote's career continued to evolve as he took on senior positions within the Canadian government. As Assistant Deputy Minister and later Deputy Minister in the Department of Northern Affairs and National Resources, he was instrumental in shaping policies that affected Canada's vast northern territories and Indigenous populations. Throughout his long and distinguished career, Cote remained a staunch advocate for bilingualism in Canada. He recognized the importance of both English and French in the nation's identity and his bilingual background allowed him to bridge linguistic cultural divides effectively. Even in his later years, Cote remained engaged with public life. Just like Albin, right? Yeah. They're incredibly interesting guys. Yes, they are definitely, both of them. Both of these men, and, and otherwise, but we, we went into some, some depth about, 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 about the men in this case, 
they're I'd, I'd be fascinated to talk to either one of them yeah it's really interesting that both of these people end up being targeted yeah i mean the, the both of them are sort of in many ways top echelon in society in, t- in terms of thinkers and, and, and in terms of um, being active in communities and with the country you know mm-hmm. it, it's they're, they're both you know they maybe not high profile high profile as and we all know their names but like people that did something with themselves and did something for the country or for their communities right yep one gets the sense that maybe the attacker in both cases resented people who had a big impact on Canadian life. Perhaps he felt really small, and attacking significant people like this made him feel like he was superior somehow. On the afternoon of December 18, 2014, Ernest Cote was alone in his apartment in a high-rise building in Ottawa's Sandy Hill neighborhood. Around 2 p.m., there was a knock on his door. The visitor identified himself as a City of Ottawa employee claiming he needed to check Cote's pipes. Trusting and unsuspecting, Cote opened the door. Cote had only cracked the door a bit when the man forced himself inside. It was quickly obvious that the intruder wasn't who he said he was and had no legitimate business being there. The intruder quickly overpowered Ernest despite his attempts to resist. The stranger then tied Ernest's hands with duct tape and placed a plastic bag over his head, leaving the older man struggling to breathe. The man ransacked Ernest's apartment, stealing cash and other valuables, including Ernest's banking and credit cards. The invader demanded the pins for Ernest's cards, and quick-thinking Ernest Cote gave the bad guy fake ones. Throughout this ordeal, which lasted around 30 minutes, Ernest Cote remained remarkably calm. He later recounted that he focused on controlling his breathing to conserve oxygen and stay conscious. After the man left, Ernest Cote's military training and quick thinking came into play again. Despite his advanced age and the trauma he'd just endured, he managed to free his hands from the duct tape. Then, using his teeth, he tore a hole in the plastic bag covering his head, allowing him to breathe more easily. Once he had regained his composure, Ernest made his way to the phone and called the police. He covered my face, Cote told the 911 dispatcher, and if I had not found a way to untie my wrists, I would have smothered because he covered my face with a bag. When authorities arrived, they found Cote shaken but essentially unharmed. His resilience was immediately apparent. The manager of the condo complex happened to be walking by and looked into Ernest's condo after the police had arrived. Is this a joke, he asked? Ernest replied, no, Maurice. I've been attacked. In subsequent interviews, Cote displayed an astonishing level of courage and composure. He famously stated, quote, I was never afraid. I was not afraid of the D-Day landing. I was not afraid of this attacker. Ernest did admit he was, quote, madder than a wasp. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, Ernest later said in an interview, quote, Some people think that if you're 101 years of age, you crumble up and wonder, oh, why? What was happening? No, I was just mad. End quote. The attacker had chosen the wrong victim. I love this guy so much. Me too. (laughs) What an interesting dude. I actually find him inspiring. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, because, you know, you and I are the same age. And as we get older, you're like, you know, what's old age going to be? And and this guy, I'm like, you know, I want, I want to be, I want to be like him. And he said in one interview, he said he had all his balls and he meant marbles. Uh, <laughs> but I watched an interview with him and at 101 years old, he was a sharp, sharp guy, That's like great. a sharp cookie, you know? That's great. Ernest Cote's smarts extended beyond self-preservation He had the presence of mind to preserve the duct tape used to restrain him, carefully removing it and placing it in a plastic bag. This evidence proved crucial in the investigation as it contained his attacker's DNA and that would later prove very valuable to the police in the triple murder investigation from 2007. The attack on Cote sparked outrage across Canada and brought attention to the vulnerability of elderly citizens. However, it also showcased the incredible resilience and strength that can persist even in advanced age. Cote's calm recounting of the events and his unwavering spirit in the face of such a traumatic experience inspired many, including me and Matthew. 
Ottawa police swiftly moved to gather evidence. A crucial breakthrough came when they obtained surveillance footage from Cote's condo complex, capturing images of a man calmly entering the building and walking down the hallway on Cote's floor. Investigators strategically released this footage to the media, recognizing the potential for public assistance. This move proved significant when, after seeing the widely circulated images, Ian Bush's son recognized him from his gait, clothing, and the fanny pack he wore. Driven by the desire to do the right thing, Bush's son promptly contacted the authorities with this vital information, saying he believed his dad was the person that they were looking for. Acting on this tip, police moved quickly, and by December 19th, just one day after the harrowing assault, they had charged Ian Bush in connection with the attack on Ernest Cote. So this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. This is his son. Yeah. So his son didn't go to him and talk to him about it. His son called the police. Yeah. Right? And at this point as well, he hasn't murdered anybody. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, so it it was sort of an assault only at that point in terms of... Well, it was attempted murder is what it was. But nobody was dead and we don't know the rest of the story yet. Right. So I'm wondering, you know, it's father-son relationships, right? I'm wondering if he ever had any inkling or knew his, thought his dad was a bad person or... It's it's hard it's hard it's hard to to know what you would do after Ian Bush's arrest. After Ian Bush's arrest, he was told not to contact people, including his own own family members, which extended to his son. So probably they didn't want him trying to intimidate his son in some way into recanting. Absolutely, but it's just it's just interesting in terms of within families. What would you do if he recognized your own father? I would be surprised if it was my dad, like super surprised. Well, me too, since he's been dead for a few decades. But, yeah, right. Uh, but, but it's just, you know, the question, what, you, what would you do, right? Like, mm. even if you're going to do the right thing, would you talk to him? It, I just find this fascinating that he just went straight to the police and didn't, didn't contact his father about it. But I'm glad he did. I'm so glad he did. Me too. The rapid identification and arrest not only brought swift justice for Cote, but also unexpectedly opened the door to solving the long, cold murders of the Garons and Mrs. Beniscos, the case that had puzzled them for years. Police executed two search warrants. One allowed them to take a DNA sample from Ian Bush, and a second allowed officers to enter his family home in the East Ottawa suburb of Orléans. Investigators uncovered disturbing evidence that painted a troubling portrait of Ian Bush's mindset and intentions. They seized a black leather bag which prosecutors labored a toolkit for murder, containing items such as duct tape, rubber gloves, knives, and plastic bags, suggesting premeditation and preparation for violent acts. Additionally, investigators found a handwritten journal filled with anti-government sentiments where Bush referred to tax collectors as the lowest form of humanity and likened them to extortionists. Among the evidence was also what appeared to be a hit list, indicating potential targets for violence. Furthermore, a four-page outline for a novel detailing fictional crimes was discovered, echoing the real-life murders he was accused of committing. Together, these items revealed not only Ian Bush's deep-seated anger towards government authorities, but also troubling a troubling blurring of lines between his violent fantasies and actual criminal behavior, signif- significantly bolstering the case against him. According to, CBC, according to CTV News, in his writings was one, was one in particular titled process in which Bush listed, quote, what appears to be all the usual ingredients for crime from gaining, ac- from gaining access to securing parties cash to securing cash plus credit cards and pins assets right down to leaving his calling card. Bush also kept several bogus identification cards in, in a wallet, including an RCMP inspector's ID a hydro worker's ID, a federal government ID card, 
and a delivery man's ID, end quote. The murders of the Garans and Mrs. Beniscos were, weren't the only ones police looked at Bush for. According to the National Post, police also retested evidence in the, ins- the, unsolved, homis- in the unsolved homicide of Commissioner Paul Andre Simard, 63, who was found dead in his home just three months before the Garans and Beniscos were killed. There were some similarities. In April 2007, Simard was discovered in the basement of his residence on Meadowlands Drive by police performing a welfare check. He was positioned face down with his hands bound behind his back using plastic ties and his eyes covered by duct tape. The house showed signs of having been ransacked and left in disarray. There was no evidence to connect Ian Bush with this murder, however, and he was not charged. The murder of Mr. Samard remains unsolved. A $50,000 award reward, a $50,000 reward has been offered to those able to provide information about the case. As well as the attack on Ernest Cote, determined to be an attempted murder, Ian Bush was also charged with several other weapons-related offenses and three counts of first-degree murder in the 2007 Garan and Beniscos cases. The DNA that Ernest Cote had preserved matched not only the sample taken from Ian Bush, but also the perpetrator at the crime scene from 2007. The Garans and Mrs. Beniscos would finally get some justice. The 2007 murders and the attack on Ernest Cote in 2014 shared numerous striking similarities, revealing a consistent pattern of criminal behavior. In both cases, Ian Bush targeted elderly victims residing in secure luxury condominium buildings in Ottawa. The Garands were in their 70s, while Ernest was an impressive 101 years old. Bush's approach to these crimes was methodical, using public transit to reach his destinations and employing clever ruses to gain entry to the secure buildings, such as posing as a delivery person or city employee. The level of preparation for these crimes was evident in the tools Bush brought to both scenes. He carried an over-the-shoulder bag and a distinctive fanny pack containing items like rope, duct tape, plastic bags, and weapons. His attack method was chillingly similar in both instances. He bound the victim's hands behind their backs, placed plastic bags over their heads, leading to the asphyxiation of the Garans and Mrs. Beniscos, and nearly causing Ernest Cote's death. In both cases, Bush also stole credit cards from his victims, demonstrating a financial motive alongside the violent acts. Forensic evidence played a crucial role in linking Bush to both crime scenes, as well as connecting his sneakers to the shoe prints left at the murder scene. DNA matched his profile in both the Garan apartment and on the duct tape used to bind Ernest Cote. This physical evidence provided a strong connection between the two incidents despite the significant time gap of seven and a half years. Additionally, there were indications that Bush had specifically targeted these locations. He had a previous dispute with Alban Garon related to tax issues, and notes and items found in Bush's residence suggested he had planned the attack on Cote's building. The similarities between these crimes extend beyond the physical evidence and attack methods. They reveal a pattern of meticulous planning, specific victim selection, and a consistent approach to gaining entry, restraining victims, and attempting to conceal his identity. This level of similarity across the two incidents, separated by a significant period, points to a highly specific and repeated modus operandi, providing valuable insight into the perpetrator's mindset and intentions. Ian Bush's ex-wife testified that she was unaware of her husband's crime novel, which he claimed was was a sophisticated work, not the ramblings of a, quote, homicidal kook. She admitted to knowing little about Ian Bush's activities, as he often insisted his business was not her concern. Their relationship was tumultuous, marked by constant fights and emotional abuse, with Ian Bush frequently belittling her. She was the primary breadwinner, while Bush struggled with a failed consultancy, inflating its credibility by using fake associates. The former Mrs. Bush also highlighted Ian's intense anger toward taxation, recalling his refusal to pay taxes and his disdain for the tax man, calling them, quote, rat bastards. He ultimately borrowed $17,000 from his mother to settle his tax debt. 
The prosecution's theory painted a chilling picture of a man consumed by anger and resentment over a tax dispute. According to the prosecutors, Ian Bush harbored a deep-seated rage against Alban Garand, who had previously ruled against him in a tax appeal. This festering resentment allegedly drove Bush to target Garand in a premeditated act of violence. The prosecution contended that Garand was the primary focus of Bush's wrath. At the same time, his wife and their neighbor, Marie-Claire Beniscos, tragically became collateral victims simply by being present at the wrong time. The case became even more disturbing when evidence of Bush's obsession came to light. The jury was presented with a letter described as arrogant and insulting that Bush had faxed to Alban Garon years before Alban's murder. This letter, which first came to public attention in 2015, revealed the extent of Bush's fixation on tax grievances. In a bizarre and presumptuous move, Bush had summoned Garon to appear at an address in Orléans, which turned out to be Bush's own home ostensibly to review the decision that had dismissed his income tax appeal. What a twist. He wants the judge to show up at his place so the judge can answer to him. You know, arrogant and insulting maybe maybe doesn't mean threatening, right? But yeah. when when you were reading this, I was thinking, why didn't they make that connection when he was first killed? That's a good question. Maybe... Um, Garon hadn't kept a copy of the letter, and a letter, the, a copy of that letter was found then, yeah. in in Bush's right. Just just because you know the the connection to his job was just the yep. the, the fact that Alban uh, Garon's connection to his job was sort of dismissed by people. The police probably didn't know about it at the time. Yeah, some of those things were. Yeah, you're right. Because they would have investigated. They just would yeah. have. Okay. Mm-hmm. The unsettling and rather unhinged correspondence demonstrated Ian Bush's refusal to accept a court's ruling and hinted at his dangerous state of mind. The prosecution used this evidence to underscore their portrayal of Ian Bush as a man whose anger had escalated to the point of violence, ultimately leading to the tragic deaths of three innocent people. As the trial concluded in December 2017, it only took the jury of 11 men and one woman 82 minutes to find Ian Bush guilty of all three counts of first-degree murder. Ian Bush was sentenced to serve 25 years for the triple murders and a concurrent 25 years for trying to kill Ernest Cote, of which he was also found guilty. There was finally justice for Alban and Ramon Garon, Mary Claire Beniscos, and Ernest Cote, but none of them survived to see it. Ernest Cote passed away in February 2015, just a few months after the attack, at the age of 101. He was remembered not only for his distinguished military and diplomatic career, but also for his bravery and presence of mind in the face of this shocking crime. His story is a testament to the enduring human spirit and the unexpected strength that can emerge in the most challenging circumstances. Ernest Cote's life story is a testament to the impact one individual can have across multiple domains of public service, from the beaches of Normandy to the halls of the United Nations and the corridors of the Canadian government, and then finally, inside a courtroom. Cote's legacy is one of dedication, intelligence, and unwavering commitment to his country and his fellow Canadians. In March of 2024, Ian Bush asked for a new trial, claiming his sentencing for Ernest Cote's attempted murder was excessive. In June, his request for a new trial was denied. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 335, Ever a Hero, the 101-year-old who took down a killer. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Alrighty, here's our first voicemail. I say alrighty every time, don't I? Anyway, <laughs> whatever. 
Hi, guys. My name is Lindsay. I'm calling from Grand Prairie, Alberta. I was just listening to your most recent episode, um, episode number 333, and you guys had mentioned um, towards the end of the episode about um, how the family kind of rallies around or the family feigns his innocence. And I just wanted to quickly touch on that because you brought up the Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson case. I was recently watching that documentary on Netflix, and I felt exactly the same way. I think it's one thing for a family to support their loved one when they are charged with a heinous crime. Um, It's one thing to, you know, sit in the courtroom, visit them in jail, make sure that they still have family ties. It's another thing to completely deny that they were the perpetrator of a crime that is very obviously something that they did um, or even have admitted to, especially in this case. So I just really want to touch on that. But another cool connection to that is I actually met Sky Borgman, who's the director of that particular documentary on Scott and Lacey Peterson, um, this summer at Grand Con. And she actually briefly talked to me about the Scott Peterson case, and she even said the same thing. Isn't it crazy when a family rallies around someone who's very obviously guilty? So anyways, I just wanted to call, tell you guys, good job on the um, episode. I'm a longtime fan. And yeah, thanks for bringing up that part of it because I think that that's an interesting topic. Anyway, go shit in your hats. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay from Grand Prairie. Much appreciated. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Like, yes, say a relative of mine is, you know, convicted or whatever. There's all the evidence points to the fact that they're guilty and then they do their thing. I am absolutely going to support them in uh, dealing with life inside and all that kind of stuff. They're still a human being. They're still a fam- family member. But I'm not going to forget that there was a victim and that there was, you know, that all the evidence, all the evidence points in one direction in that case in particular. So it's, yeah, it's delusional. It's weird. So I don't know. Maybe other people feel differently, but they didn't call. So... <laughs> what do you think Lindsay does there in Grand Prairie, Matthew? I'm sure it's something fascinating. I actually, just be, because of the nature of the call, I think she's a family therapist. She's a family therapist. Oh, that's yeah. good. Um, there, the world needs more family therapists, I do believe. Um, uh, I probably should be talking to one now <laughs> myself because I've got a lot of stuff going on that I really, really need to... Uh, what, between you and the cats? Between me and the cats, right? Your your your, your little kitty family. <laughs> yes. Could you imagine a therapist to help you deal with your cats when they're being assholes? <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Well, I could probably use <laughs> use the <laughs> counseling for that too. Anyway. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, my kitties are fine. Actually, Egg has now become a bully when it's when it's dinner time he knows i'm certain that he knows what time it is Aww. i'm certain he does because he knows exactly when to come and bother me and say hey it's time to feed me and what he does is he will sit right beside me and uh he'll stare at me and just continue staring until i either get up Mm. Or, you know, put him down or whatever. But if I put him down, he'll get right back up, sit Aww. and stare at me. And then if I'm typing something on the computer, he'll nudge my hand because he knows I can't do what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'll get up he's, and feed he, you. He's smart. He is very smart. Both of them are pretty smart. Waffles is like wacky smart. And Egg is just smart, smart cookie smart. smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 827 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Holy smokes, again, we have a bunch of Donut Money donors and patrons. Well, let's start with some patrons first. Patreon. Patreon wowzers. Um, first up, we have from Braidwood, Illinois, our good friend Gail Novi. Gail from the Yumber Yard. Gail Novi. Yes, how about that? Well, thank you, Gail. 
Um, what do you think Gail does there in Braidwood, Matthew? Uh, she's an illicit cheese smuggler. From Canada? Like smuggles into Canada or from Canada to the United States? No, from from Paris into the oh. United States. Oh, la, la, la fromage. Yeah. Like so she, fancy cheese. Well, pro, or as we call it in Europe, proper cheese. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> though cheese is so sad in North America. It's worse in America, but it's... Well, it, cheese from the Netherlands is good, too. There's lots yeah, of so she, she specializes in sneaking in the stinkiest, most illegal cheeses um, oh. in, in, into America. Well, there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> Unpasteurized, awesome. unpasteurized contraband, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, next up we have another familiar name, Jessica Muirhead. Jessica. Jess. I think uh, I was chatting with Jessica just today. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Well, that's yeah. nice. She's from Barrie, Ontario. I Barry. have friends, friends in Barrie, Ontario. My good friend Dana, formerly last name of Zinc, she runs the locker room uh, bar in Barrie. So if you ever are at the locker room in Barrie, say Mike Brown sent me here. Sounds like a gay bar. <laughs> no, I don't. It's a sports bar. It's not a gay bar. Okay. It's, it's a sports bar. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> oh, yep. Very possibly. <laughs> what do you, what do you think Jessica does there in Barrie, Matthew? Well, you just told me what she does. What's that? The bar. Oh, she works at the bar? Well, oh, okay. Didn't, no, didn't you? Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. That That's was my friend Dana. Friend. My I'm friend Dana sorry. owns it. No, I know what she does. She's Matthew's an sleepy. I, I am. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's been t 13 hours. Uh, she's an anti-influencer photographer. What is that? So she specializes in catching influencers in their least glamorous moments and selling oh, no. se selling these like candid unfiltered shots to the tabloids it's kind of you know it's a job she makes money at it but she also likes taking down influencers well i know a lot of influencers now i met through uh, uh a certain tv show that i'm gonna be on which i can now talk about <laughs> But um, hopefully she doesn't take down any of my friends because they are all nice people. They are, regardless okay. of the game that we played. Anyway, <laughs> so that's an interesting job. Next, from Regina, Saskatchewan, we have Sarah Watt. Sarah Watt. From Sarah? Regina. Yes. Sarah organizes riots. She's a riot organizer? Yep. Wow. If you think about it, you know, think, people think it's just total anarchy, but it has to be well planned. Yep. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. They don't, riots don't just happen. <laughs> no, they just, they don't. <laughs> it's not spur of the moment. Yeah. Well, okay. So Sarah's, Sarah's busy planning riots in Regina. <laughs> I don't think there's a big sort of, uh, she wouldn't be super busy doing that in Regina I don't think no but. I mean I mean Manitobans are more known more for riding than than Saskatch what is the word Saskatchewan that's a great question S S Saskatchewanites maybe I don't S know S S Saskatchewaners Saskatchewan see I know Ontarians and Nova Scotians but I don't and know British Columbians and right. Saskatchewanians Yep, who knows? We should look it up, but I'm Sask not going to. Saskatchewankers? <laughs> no, be careful now. <laughs> no, I actually... That's not that, true. Absolutely not. You know? Do you know how beautiful parts of Saskatchewan is? I um, do, because I've driven through parts of yeah, Saskatchewan. Yeah, the, um, the uh, Saskatoon is drop-dead gorgeous. I have never been there. I really do want to go, yeah. but I've never been to Saskatoon. That is on my bucket list. Saska eggs. <laughs> oh boy. Next we have from Newbury in the United Kingdom, Matthew. Mm. Susan Clark. Susan Clark from Newbury. Ah, she's a professional queue stander in her. Oh, so she stands in queues. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah. So pair. for so for people who are like wanting to get tickets for something and uh, she charges $120 an hour. Uh Pounds, Matthew. Oh, pounds. Right? 
Yes. It has to be. She has to charge in pounds. So, you you know. Yeah. Didn't you live Eat there it. for a long time? She you doesn't know. want to charge in dollars because the pound has just gone up on the dollar. Right. It continues to do so. Well, thank you, Susan, from Newbury. Enjoy standing in a queue, and hopefully it's not too rainy. <laughs> Next up, we have from Arthur, Ontario, Karen Purvis. Karen Purvis from Arthur, Ontario. Where's Arthur, Matthew? Do you know where that is? I, I always assume that you know where places in Ontario are. Arthur, it's just after the town of B. <laughs> it's close to B, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh. actually it's actually a combined town. It, it's it's they've grown into each B other. B slash and, Arthur, <laughs> and now it's known as B Arthur. Yeah, it's a golden place. It it's really the, is. It's in the it's tri- a golden gal of a place. It's in the Tri-County area. <laughs> in the Tri-County area. Oh, dear. Well, thank you, Karen, so much, and everybody else who uh, I have to became give, a patron. I have, to, I have to give Karen a job. Oh, what did she do? Oh, yes. What does she do there in Bl- B. Arthur? <laughs> black market meme dealer. Oh, she deals in black... Oh, and, and you're probably her biggest... Um, yeah, customer but, because you steal memes like nobody's business but she she steals memes um that governments don't want shared so she knows how to grab them before they're taken down by by governments and corporations uh in order to uh disseminate interesting yeah well there you go i you know what i want i want to see like a i'm going to go to a museum mm-hmm. somebody should do Somebody should do a, a exhibit on memes in a museum, in a proper museum. Wouldn't that be cool? It, with, with uh, and to talk about their social influence and everything else, it'd be quite fascinating, actually. It would. Hmm. Charlie bit my finger. <laughs> oh, Charlie! Oh, <laughs> Charlie! Oh, Charlie! All right, let's move on to donut money donors, and we have a few of those too. Uh, Christine Illix, and her name is spelled I-L-X. That's interesting. i would never seen that name before. I-L-X, Illix. Illix, and she is from Toronto, Ontario. I'm probably butchering it, or it could be 2 times X, 11X. <laughs> could be a number of things. Illix. Um, but yeah, she's from Toronto, Matthew. Toronto. Toronto. What does she do in Toronto? What does Christine do in Toronto? Celebrity scandal architect. So Oh, so she's into that stuff too. Yeah, so what she does. This is slightly different though. She um she actually designs the architect of a celebrity a meltdown or a divorce. It's all fake, but just to get publicity. Mm-hmm. You know when you see see things like at the front of like Hello Magazine, it's like my husband cheated on me when I was nine months pregnant, and there's a picture of him and her on the front cover. Okay, and, it's, and they're like they're doing like a a sort of something that was deeply personal that happened in your relationship that you're working through, but they splash it on the front cover of the tabloid and like pay for it. She creates those stories because half the time they did didn't even happen. Oh, dear. Yeah, she makes good money at it. Well, I I assume you would. Yeah. Next, we have Ann Duffin. Ann Duffin. And Ann doesn't tell us where she's from or what she does for a living, Matthew. So you're on with this one. (laughs) I'm I'm on, am I? Yes. She's a cryptocurrency assassin. Oh, cryptocurrency assassin. That sounds yeah. like a job that didn't exist three years ago. No, it's true. She and she lives in Dubai. Oh, interesting. So does she she takes cryptocurrency for assassinating people? No. Okay. No, she assassinates people that own cryptocurrency companies. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, there you go. Someone's gotta do it. She's an assassin. <laughs> Steve do Heaton you, is no okay. do, do you know that the word assassin comes uh, from the word from hashish? Ha- hash, hash smokers? Yes, yes hashish. Yeah, it there, definitely there does. Go. Yes, I knew that. I went to university and took literature. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, next we have Steve Heaton. He's back. 
He says, uh, great job, guys. Took a break from the bumper cars, the job you gave, lol, to get you some donuts from the fair. Joining Patreon next, so keep up the good work and go shit in a paper hat so it all soggy. <laughs> <laughs> so it all soggy. So it all soggy. Oh, dear, Steve. Well, Steve. thank you. Thank he you, is, Steve. He, Steve is a street art critic. Oh, he does that, too, as well so, as his bumper car job. Yeah, so on top of the bumper cars, mm -hmm. he, he tags tags. There, he's a tag tagger. <laughs> tag tag! Yeah, on tag your wrist. And he has his own hashtag as well. Hashtag nice. tag tag. <laughs> tag tag. <laughs> and does he, like, uh, wear clothes with tags? So he's the tag tag Yeah, tag re wearer? remember Minnie Pearl? Yeah, she always had the tag on her hat. He, he always has a, a price tag on his baseball cap. Oh, there you go. That's nice. You know when <laughs> these people wear baseball caps with this sticker that is sold to sell the cap and they leave the sticker on? Yes. That I want to... Okay, I'm not a man of violence. Those people annoy me. <laughs> yeah, you, you wanted to say slap, but... Oh, no, it's like, take your sticker off. <laughs> Just whip the sticker off of their hat. Yeah, just hey, that's a job for somebody right around ripping stickers off of baseball caps. Well, that's probably what Tracy Liddell from Pacifica, California, does. She's, it is actually funny. She, I didn't realize she was next. <laughs> yeah, she is next. <laughs> so there you go. So that's what Tracy does. She just runs around and rips the and, stickers and, off people's baseball caps. And I personally pay her for it. That's how there she, you go. That, that's how it's a job. Matthew is very concerned about this for some reason. So, you know. Doesn't it just annoy the hell out of you? No. Okay. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. People walking around like they're 12 years old. Oh, boy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me. Whatever happened to a good three-piece suit? Whatever happened to a good three-piece suit? That's a good question. That is you know, a good question. You know, with wool from the Outer Hebrides. Well, yeah, and it was it was that damn JFK who uh, didn't wear a hat, and then men stop, stopped wearing fancy hats, too. So it was uh, all JFK's I was gonna, fault. I was going to tell a really bad joke, but I'm not. Oh, but he doesn't need a hat because he didn't have a head. But, yeah, that's well, horrible. That's awful. That's an awful joke we won't tell. All right. Well, that is it for patrons and donut money donors. Oh. Thank you, folks. We'll get to it. There's more coming in, too. So uh, we will get to you folks next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Right. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. And so, until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Bye.